Hello, everyone! This is Mason Haggett, here from the Casino Co. Official. And today, we're going to be reading Just a Story 2, Goldie and the Seven Stars, Chapter 6, The Land of the Forgotten, and Chapter 7, This Means War! Narrator, Isaac and Goldie take a seat in front of Ethan S. and Dr. Gage, who have already been enjoying their tacos and burritos. Isaac quickly consumes his tacos and burritos because he hadn't even had breakfast that day. On the other hand, Goldie already ate all of his in 10 seconds because he just ate them like potato chips. Dr. Gage, you guys seem hungry, Goldie. Of course we are! Isaac, we literally just got in a fight with a demon that you created and basically won. Plus, I didn't have breakfast or lunch today. Dr. Gage, oh, oh yeah, that explains it. Narrator, they silently enjoy their food for a little as Ethan S. asks a question. Ethan S., do you know anything about the Void Doctor? Dr. Gage, Ooh, a little bit. I know that it's a highly destructive force of nature and that the guilt had a part of it inside of him. But other than that, no, not really. Goldie, what's the guilt? Isaac, don't worry about it. It's just something sh Charlie killed. Goldie, oh, okay. Ethanus, how do you know that there's a piece of the void inside of the guilt? Dr. Gage, well, I did have to do some experiments on it before I put a piece of it inside the Goofy R2000. Isaac, so that's probably why it went rogue. Narrator, everyone agrees as they continue to eat the amazing tacos and burritos. Isaac, man, I remember the first time I came to this universe. It was so beautiful. I remember sitting on the train and looking out the window. It was magical. Sometimes I'd come to this universe just to go on that train and look out the window. Now, after 60 years, it's kind of boring now. Ethan S., can you remind me how time works in the Forgotten Realm? Isaac, it doesn't. That's why everyone stays the same age when they go there. Ethan S., oh, okay, that's what I thought. I was just seeing if by a chance you knew anything more. Isaac, honestly, I know just as much as you do about time in that universe. Goldie, just curious, why is your magic weapon a baseball bat? Ethan S., well, I, I kind of like baseball. Goldie, bro, baseball sucks. Cricket, cricket is better. Ethan S., what did you just say to me? Narrator, they argue about this as Isaac gets a call on his phone. Isaac, all right, guys, I have to get this call, so I'll be back. Narrator, he goes to the bathroom. Inside, it's dirtier than a Waffle House restroom. Isaac, hello? Charlotte, what's taking you so long? Isaac, oh, me and the boys decide to stop at Luigi's. Charlotte, ooh, in that case, can you guys get me some too? Isaac, we already did. I'm just hoping Goldie didn't eat it. <laughs> Charlotte, all right, well, see you later. See you soon. Narrator, she then hangs up the phone. Isaac, well, looks like some expectations are set. Narrator, he walks out of the bathroom to the site of a food fight between Ethan S. and Goldie. Food stains cut. Food stains cover every inch of the walls. It seems as if they have created teams with the staff and other customers. Ethan S. Baseball is the best sport ever! Some guy named Greg. Yeah! Goldie. No, cricket ball is better! Literally nobody. Yeah, let's go! Narrator. Food is flying all over the place. Isaac. Whoop! Looks like I better buy Charlie some tacos because it looks like they used the ones I saved for her in the food fight. Narrator. A burrito hits him in the head as it slowly falls off. Isaac. That's it! One hour later. Narrator. The full ore come flying out of the portal, covered with bits and pieces of food. Ethan S. Now, do you think, now do you think baseball is better? Goldie. Nah. Isaac. Please just shut up! Narrator, they finally stop, ar stop arguing. 
Ethan S. So I'm going to go home so I can take a shower, because in case you haven't seen me, I look pretty nasty. Dr. Gage, yeah, I need one too, so I'm going to the lab to use the public one. Isaac, wait, hold up. There's a public one? Dr. Gage, yeah, they installed it when you and Charlotte were gone. Isaac, oh, okay. Whatever, just make sure to stop by tomorrow to explain yourself, because she is bound to have questions. Dr. Gage, okay. Meanwhile, narrator, Perry is cleaning up the place, while Charlotte sleeps quietly like an angel. It's currently 9.04 at night, and the fireplace has been going most of the day because of the excessive snowstorms outside. But she is then rudely awakened as Isaac swings open the door. Isaac, I got a star! Narrator, he holds it up in the air as Perry looks in shock. Perry, wow, my sister was right. You are actually responsible. Now, we have three out of seven. Wasn't there another one there, though? Isaac, we will talk to you about that tomorrow. Would you agree with me, Goldie? Goldie, nod, nod. Perry, all right, you two can tell us tomorrow. Just please take a shower. You two smell horrible. Charlotte, do you guys remember my tacos from Luigi's? Isaac, oh yeah, about that. Ethan has chucked the first batch at Goldie, and then Goldie ate the second one on the way here. Charlotte, <sighs> okay. Brother, I'm going to my bed now. You can sleep in the guest room in the basement. Perry, all right. Narrator, after their showers, Isaac slowly falls asleep on the couch as Goldie jumps onto the living room floor, falling asleep, but su successfully waking everyone in the house up as well. Next day, narrator, Perry wakes up on the mildly uncomfortable bed that is in the guest room. The room is entirely made out of this old smelly wood, and there's a closet in there with nothing but a blue hoodie. There's a picture frame on the nightstand with a picture of a burrito inside of it. Perry, a picture of a burrito. Narrator, Perry gets the feeling that this used to be Isaac's room, and one thing he has gotten from Isaac is that there is more to him than what meets the eye. Perry removes the picture of the burrito from the frame and sees another picture behind it of him and two other people from the Ethan S. Boss Battle realm. Perry, well look at that. Veronica Benavides, the previous royal judge. Isaac Benavides, the current royal judge and Michael Benavides, who is supposed to be the future royal judge. He would have probably not been the royal judge. He would have probably been the royal judge of that universe right now if my sister had not destroyed it. I wonder if they all had knowledge of the fourth wall, or if the information would be passed down and forgotten when a new royal judge was declared. Narrator, Perry decides not to think of this right now. He will ask Isaac later, though, because this is far too interesting. But for now, he is going to wake up Charlotte. For the day, he opens the door and walks up the long staircase as he opens the door into the halls, hall and walks into the living room where Isaac, Goldie, and Brownie are sleeping. He decides not to wake them because they had a rough time the previous day. He walks up the stairs to the site of another living room that was once a disaster, but now looks really good because of him. He then pulls one of the books on the sh bookshelf as the entrance to Charlotte's bedroom opens. He walks up yet another sheet of stairs into her bedroom, which which now looks fit for a queen, because Perry cleaned it up. Perry, it's time to rise and shine, sister. Charlotte, but I don't want to. Perry, but sister, we still have four more stars to collect. Charlotte, just get Isaac to get them. Narrator, Perry leaves her room as she falls back asleep. But then, she has a loud clanging noise as she is rudely awakened yet again. Good morning, Charlie! Narrator, Isaac is banging cymbals together and Charlotte has no idea where he got them from. Charlotte, Isaac, I'm going to kill you! Narrator, he then teleports back downstairs as Charlotte gets out of bed. Perry, are you awake now? Charlotte, wait, did you tell him to do that? Perry, yeah, it only took ten bucks. <laughs> Perry, anyways, let's start our day. Narrator, Perry goes downstairs and pulls a breakfast cake out of the refrigerator and places it on the counter. Charlotte then comes down the stairs wearing her usual jeans and blue tank top, but this time she was also wearing a blue hoodie because of how cold it is. She th 
She sits on one of the chairs next to Perry as Isaac teleports into the kitchen. Isaac, wait, you guys are having coffee cake without coffee? Perry, oh, that's what it's called. Isaac, yeah, you big dingus. How do you like your coffee? Perry, I like a big scoop of ice cream in it with whipped cream and sprinkles. Isaac, oh, I'm sorry, but I don't know how to make alien food. Here's a better question. Creamer or no creamer? Perry, uh, creamer, please. Isaac, what about you, Goldie? Narrator, Goldie is still laying on the floor staring at the ceiling. Goldie, yeah, I'd like creamer, too. Isaac, and I'm guessing you would like your usual. Am I correct, Charlie? Charlotte, yep. Isaac, all right, then. Narrator, he gives everyone their cups of coffee as he sits on the seat on the other side of Perry. Isaac, hey, Goldie, your coffee's ready. Goldie, okay. Narrator, he moves the chair next to Isaac out of the way and stands because he was too big for the chair. Perry, hold up. How can you and Isaac drink your coffee straight black? Isaac, I like it because it tastes like agony, just like my soul. Charlotte, and I like it plain because it tastes like the blood of my enemies. Perry, okay, I'll just pretend like I didn't ask. Narrator, Goldie then throws his slice of cake into his mouth, and then the coffee with the cup included into his gullet. Goldie, holy crap, this is good. Who made this? Charlotte, I did. Perry, wait, you made this, Charlie? Charlotte, yes, I did. I picked up the hobby of baking when you were dead. Perry, nice. Well, we have, well, when we have time, you're going to show me some of your new recipe. You so, sh Perry, nice. Well, when we have time, you're going to sh have to show me some of your recipes. Charlotte, okay, we'll do. Narrator, they sit there and eat silently, enjoying their food for ten minutes, until they hear the door open and see Dr. Gage walk in. Dr. Gage, yo. Narrator, everyone is surprised to see him. Isaac, honestly? I didn't even expect they to show up. Dr. Gage, I don't know how I got here. Isaac, take a seat. I believe he got some stuff to explain. Dr. Gage, nah, I'd rather stand. Narrator, he stands in front of the counter. Dr. Gage, okay, so, you know, one day I was walking around looking for more guilt remnants so that I could finalize that gardening robot that you wanted me to make. Charlotte, okay. Dr. Gage, but then I found a hole and ended up in the one night of the Jolly Rogers universe. I then met this funny guy with a mustache and he repurposed my gardening robot and turned it into a killing machine. And he asked me to finalize it for $20 and a go -gurt. Perry, and what did you say? Dr. Gage, bro, I couldn't say no. That Gogurt is too good to resist. So I finalized it with a power star and a bit of remnant from the gill. Isaac, so that's what was dripping out of it. Charlotte, wait, you fought Mecha Charlotte? Isaac, yeah, and its real name is the Goofy 2000. Narrator, they tell Perry and Charlotte about their adventures the previous day and how crazy it was. Perry, that was oddly convenient that she was low on batteries. Isaac, yes, I admit, if it weren't for that, we would have died. Charlotte, so, one of the stars is powering the, <laughs> the Goofy Yacht 2000? Dr. Gage, precisely. Charlotte, that's great. S sarcasms. Do you know where Dr. Mustache is going next? Dr. Gage, he said something about Jolly and Dinosaurs. Goldie, so she's the one who stole all my stacks. Narrator, everyone except Goldie is in shock after hearing the name Jolly. Charlotte, didn't I kill her? Dr. Gage, well, apparently she's still alive. Charlotte, well, come on, guys, it's time to go. Narrator, Charlotte walks out the front door. Goldie, I'm assuming we should take that as a sign to get go and get going. Narrator, Perry and Goldie walk out the door as Isaac teleports outside. Dr. Gage. Welp, I guess it's just me here now. Narrator. As soon as Isaac teleports outside, he sees a minuscule scratch on the outside of his sports car. Isaac. Did anybody drive my sports car when I was gone? Perry. Just the fat pizza guy and Gus. Isaac. Hold on. I need to do something very quick. Narrator. Isaac teleports somewhere. Charlotte. Isaac! I swear, if you're not back... In the next three seconds, I'm going to... Isaac, I'm back. Charlotte, well, that was quick. What did you do? 
Isaac. I dunked Mr. Pizza on the basketball hoop and then gave Gus a whitewash in the snow using blue magic. Goldie, you should have invited me to join you, man. Perry, come on, guys. Narrator, Perry has been sitting there with the portal open for a while. Goldie rolls in, followed by Isaac, and then Charlotte and Perry walk in at the same time. As Perry walks through the portal, he begins to see a vision. Universes fall as they are consumed by light. As life is destroyed every millisecond, and the last thing Perry sees in his vision is Isaac, surrounded by seven advanced human souls. Goldie, are you okay? Perry, yeah, well, Perry, yeah, why? Goldie, well, you're just staring into the distance for around a minute. Perry, I feel the void coming. We need to make a move now. Charlotte, all right, brother. If it's that urgent, then let's get the show on the road. Isaac, you go help Goldie get his stacks back. Perry, try to get the star that Jolly took back as well. Isaac, uh, and are you guys going to sit back and relax while I'm gone? Is that it? Charlotte, exactly, Isaac. Now get going. Goldie, how rude. Narrator, the two walk away. Perry, so unlike the one night on the Jolly Rogers universe, this universe actually existed before I died, so I should remember where the other two stars are here. Charlotte, what about Mecca Charlotte? Perry, don't worry, I'm sure we will see her along the way, but I know one of the stars is with the gatekeeper, and another one is located in the Forgotten Land. Charlotte, man, with all these realms and lands with Forgotten at the beginning of them, I'm beginning to wonder if Father just forgot the names of these places, so he just labeled them as forgotten. Perry, come on, Charlie. Narrator, they start walking towards their destination. They cross a couch the size of a mountain, and many houses and buildings designed by the little plastic dinosaurs. The floor of this universe is made out of the dirty uh, out of a dirty wood. The soles of their shoes are already pitch black. Many dinosaurs give them weird looks, and others come up to talk to them. Chris the Proceratosaurus. Do you two have anything to do with that jolly person? Perry. No, not at all. Charlotte. In fact, I'm here to finish her off. Perry. <sighs> Why might you ask? Chris the Proceratosaurus. The only humans we've seen here are people that are working for Queen Jolly, and she has been enslaving dinosaurs from this universe for a very long time. Perry. Well, we will be different. We're actually here to help. Heck, we already have one of our friends out there helping. Charlotte, and if I know anything about him, it's that he always gets the job done. Chris the Proceratosaurus. Thank you. I'll make sure everyone else knows that you're safe too. Narrator. He runs off and begins telling fellow plastic dinosaurs about Charlotte and Perry. Eventually, they begin to come up and talk to them and ask them questions. One of them even recognizes Charlotte as that one girl that would drag Isaac out of the Indoraptor's casino. Perry, you look pretty miserable on that hoodie shirt, Charlie. Charlotte, you're right, I am. Narrator, due to the extreme heat of this universe, Charlotte takes off her hoodie and wraps it around her waist. Charlotte, I don't even know why I had it on still. Narrator, the two chuckle as they make it to a fishing dock. Perry, okay, so I'm pretty sure that it's over Charlotte. Over where? Per Perry, crap, we're going, ha we're going to have to go overseas. Charlotte, I could just surf on my axe over the water until we got there. Perry, for more than 50 miles? Charlotte, actually, you can just make a portal there, right? Perry, I may have been alive for billions of years, but believe it or not, I've never been there before. Charlotte, <sighs> lame. Perry, how about we just get a boat from the fishing place over there? Narrator, Perry points over to Wal a Walmart. Charlotte, I'm pretty sure that's a Walmart, brother, and last time I checked, they sold walls, Perry. <sighs> Not the time for puns, Charlie. And besides, I wasn't pointing there. I was pointing at that building. Narrator. Charlotte sees where P Perry was pointing. He was pointing at this old run-down shop called Foxy's Fishing Licenses and Co. Next to the Walmart that was in front of the ocean like the other buildings in that area. Charlotte. By chance, can we go to Walmart first to buy a wooden spoon because Isaac broke my last one? Perry, the void is approaching, and that's what you're thinking about? Charlotte, yeah, why? Perry, 
Let's just go get a boat, sister. Narrator. Perry holds onto his sister's hand as they walk into the fishing place as they go up to the creature at the front counter. He is wearing an eye patch, and he seems to be a mechanical fox of some sorts, and his legs are propped up on the counter as he is reading a newspaper. Perry. Hi, you're Foxy, right? Foxy the pirate. Yeah, why? You need to get somewhere? Perry. Yeah, we need to get to a bedroom... We need to get to Bedroom Square in the Nublar Providence, Foxy. All right, that will cost you 36 doubloons, Perry. We don't have doubloons, Charlotte, but I think you might be interested in this. Narrator, she pulls a giant tooth out of her pocket as Foxy's jaw drops. Foxy, how'd you get a megalodon tooth? Charlotte, don't ask. Narrator, she gives the tooth to the plastic fox as he jumps up with joy. Foxy, this is going right in my bedroom. Anyways, the coffin will shall be deporting in ten minutes. Please take a look around my shop while you wait. Narrator, Perry goes and sits on a bench and grabs a newspaper from the box next to it as Charlotte looks around, but then she gets bored and sits next to Perry. Charlotte, what does a computer call his father? Perry, man, I don't know. I couldn't possibly think of an answer. P Charlotte, data? Haha, <laughs> very funny. Charlotte, what do you get when you cross a snowman with a vampire? A dinosaur? Charlotte, wrong. Frostbite. Perry, <sighs> let me think of one. Narrator, despite Bun's puns being completely rude for him by his sister, he has been alive for a couple billion years, so he has to be able to come up with at least one good one. Perry, I have a good one. The U.S. Mint has a fit announced a 50 cent piece will be issued. On one side of the coin will be Theodore Roosevelt. On the other, Nathan Hale. Someone asked why this design had been chosen. The official answer, the official answered, now, when you have a coin toss, it can simply call Ted's or Hale's. Narrator, Charlotte laughed at this pun, but Perry can't understand why because of how bad it was. Charlotte, that was great, Perry. Perry, it was? Narrator, before Charlotte could ask Perry to tell her another joke, Foxy came in. Foxy, all aboard! Narrator, the two follow Foxy out to the dock, where they see a glorious pirate ship. The two walk as the boards creak under their feet. Foxy goes to where the steering wheel is located on the boat and turns it on as they set sail. Perry looks down at the water from the side of the boat as Charlotte looks at Foxy's sword collection in the boat that was randomly sliding up and down the ship. The water mysteriously looks like it has a papery texture to it. Perry. Hey, Charlie, can you come over here? Charlotte. Yeah? Narrator. Charlotte comes over to Perry. Perry. Remember that conversation we had in your bedroom? Charlotte, yeah, what, what about it? Perry, well, if we encounter anyone in the Forgotten Land that tries to attack us, try to calm down the situation rather than escalating it further, all right, sister? Charlotte, okay, I'll try. Narrator, Charlotte goes back to doing her thing as Perry analyzes more of the surroundings of the universe. He's been there so many times, but yet every time he goes to the Goldie the Casino Raptor universe, it always gives off a strange feeling. The sun is a light attached to a ceiling fan, and when it turns night, it's almost like someone just hits a light switch. This has always perplexed Perry how time works in this universe, but then again, he shouldn't even wonder this because time doesn't even work in his universe. Foxy, we have arrived at your destination. Now, get off! Narrator, they walk off the ship as they step foot on a different type of wood. This wood is a lighter color than the wood of the mainland of the Nublar, of Nublar, and it smells like soggy onions in this area for some reason. To the side of the room is a bed, and in the front of the room, there's a chest of drawers with laundry barfing out of them, and of course, they're all giant. Charlotte, well, this place is almost as bad as my bedroom. Perry, let's get to the Forgotten Land as soon as possible. Narrator, they jump over dirty laundry piles and climb a giant trash can until they are at the door of the Forgotten Land. Perry, all right, I'm pretty sure this is where Father said it would be. Narrator, a giant door looms above them that is about 1,000 feet tall. 
Perry uses the black ink on his belt to paint an oval just big enough for him and Charlotte to fit through. The paint burns the wood until all that's left is a perfectly burnt oval that leads into the forgotten land. Charlotte, what's the holdup? Narrator, there was no holdup. Perry, alright, here we go. Narrator, Perry enters the land first, followed by Charlotte. The farther they walk, the darker it gets. Charlotte holds on to Perry's hand, and she can feel him shaking out of fear. She summons a fireball that floats nicely above her hand, but it doesn't light up the surrounding area. But Perry can see Charlotte's face now. Charlotte, are you scared? Perry, yes I am. There's no reason. It should be this dark in here. It just doesn't make sense. Charlotte, then again, what does make sense in this universe? Perry, yeah, right. <laughs> huh. Narrator, they continue walking while it gets darker still. Charlotte, ah! Perry, what is it? Charlotte, why do the walls have eyes? Narrator, Perry then remembers that Charlotte has night vision. Perry, wait, you can see in it here? Charlotte, just barely. It's so dark in here that even my night vision is a little fuzzy. But I can definitely see the, that the walls have eyes. Narrator, then she looks at Perry, but he is no longer there. And she lifts the hand that was holding on to Perry's hand to her face and sees that he is gone. Charlotte. Perry! Narrator. Charlotte was terrified. She just found Perry again, and now she's lost him again. And not only that, but it was so dark that even her night vision was failing her. She begins to run towards where she saw Perry before. He mysteriously disappeared. Charlotte. Perry! Perry! Where are you? Please, I can't lose you again! Narrator. Then she is tripped by an unknown being, as a bunch of little creatures tear little pieces of flesh off her arms and legs. She summons a force field around herself, but it does not, doesn't do anything to protect her. More flesh pieces keep on getting removed, and she begins to laugh out of joy. A chocolate smell is identified by the creatures as she puts her hands together as a beam of concentrated plasma comes firing out of them towards where she thinks her enemy is, but she doesn't hit anything. Then she hears the creature begin to chant, We won't die. 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 Narrator. The chanting continues as she falls on her knees and begins to go mad. She snaps her fingers and summons the Almighty Government Destructor, which is a giant glowing axe her father gave her for Christmas. She begins to swing at where she thinks they are, but to no prevail. She feels them grab onto her arms and drag her away. She closes her eyes and begins to wonder, Charlotte, is this how I'm really going to die? The angel of death, a perfect killing machine, is going to die like this, leaving the multiverse to a hungry void that will consume it. Narrator. But then she begins to hear a voice inside her head. The puppet master. Charlotte. My daughter. This is not how you go out. I designed you with the ability to kill anything. You can even kill the unkillable. Narrator. Then Charlotte opens her eyes and a mashes one of the mysterious beings in the back of their head using the government destructor. That being lets go. We won't die. Narrator. Now Charlotte can see perfectly. The beings that were attacking her and Perry were these plastic dinosaurs that looked half zombified. And they were also very glitched with some of them having their arms switched with their legs and others having 15 heads. Charlotte. Wrong. I can kill anything. Narrator. She summons a ball of pure concentrated death and chucks them at the creatures, causing them to turn into dust almost instantly. She limps to where she sees Perry, tied up by what looks like pieces of flesh, and unhinges him. Perry. Charlotte, is that you? Narrator. Charlotte falls into his arms and passes out from blood loss. One hour later. Narrator, Charlotte wakes up in Perry's arms, on top of the giant couch in the mainland of the Nublar Providence. Perry, are you okay, sister? Charlotte, like always, you are the best healer in the multiverse. Narrator, she stands up on her legs. Perry, what happened there? Charlotte, these plastic dinosaurs attacked us, and they looked... off. You know how the normal creatures of this universe don't bleed? They just break apart into plastic, plastic pieces? Perry, yeah, what about it? 
Charlotte. Well, these creatures could bleed. Narrator. Perry is shocked by this, but he doesn't dwell on it. Perry. We have seen a lot of strange stuff the last couple of days, huh? Charlotte. Yeah. Perry. I got the star, by the way, in case you're wondering. Charlotte. Thank you. I was wondering. Anyways, we should get going now. After all, we only need three more stars. So where is the next star? Perry. Well, thankfully, I've been to its location before, so it should be pretty easy to find. The hard thing is that we just need to get it from the gate guardian. Charlotte. Oh, then again, he is a pretty reasonable man. Perry. Dragon, you mean. Charlotte. Yeah, dragon that our father was friends with. And besides, we were friends with him, remember? He used to let us ride on his back and we would soar through the air. Perry. Yeah, still, we are just asking him for his most valued valued item that just so happens to be the centerpiece of his crown. Plus, didn't he almost kill you one time? Charlotte. Eh, who cares? Plus, I was the one that attacked him first. Narrator. Charlotte summons a portal. You coming? Perry. I guess. Charlotte is really energetic for almost... Charlotte is really energetic for almost dying. When they step foot in the... Step foot in front of the fourth wall. They see this big rubber dragon standing in front of it, facing down with his sword in the ground. He is wearing a white cape, which is covering his wings, and he has one of the seven stars in the middle of his crown, glowing with glory. Charlotte, hello, can we? Narrator, the gate guardian cuts him off as he pulls his sword out of his out of the ground with a fiery rage and holds it in front of the glowing white void that is the fourth wall. The fourth wall was always a mystery to Charlotte. Her father told her that it was the entrance to reality, whatever that meant. The gate guardian. guardian. You shall not pass! Narrator. Then he looks down at who he's talking to and bows down as he says, The gate guardian. Greetings, angel of death. Greetings, angel of life. What might be your bidding? Charlotte, uh, Perry, no need to bow, your highness. The gate guardian, no need to call me your highness either, for that's what I should be calling you and your sister. Narrator, he stands back on his feet. The gate guardian, so what brings you here? Does the puppet master need me for anything? Narrator, all of Perry's fear is gone now. Perry, not really. The void is approaching, though, and we need the star on your crown. The gate guardian, I see. It's that time already. Narrator, the 120 foot tall dragon takes his crown off and takes a star out of it and then throws it to Perry. Perry catches it seamlessly. The gate guardian, please help it to fulfill its destiny. Just please bring it back when you're done. Perry slash Charlotte, will do. Narrator, Perry summons a portal as him and Charlotte walk through. They are teleported to the place where they first entered this universe, a desolate little area with no inhabitants. Charlotte and Perry decide to sit down and take a break before they go help Isaac and Goli claim the next star, but little did they know they were being watched. Becca Charlotte, enemy spotted, waiting for a chance to eliminate. Narrator. She watches carefully as she sees Charlotte slowly begin to fall asleep, and then Perry begins to fall asleep as well. She snaps her fingers and summons her scythe, and uses a portal to teleport down from the tree silently as she wraps the scythe around Charlotte's neck. Mecca Charlotte. Good night, sweet dreams. Narrator. Before she could behead Charlotte, she is bombarded by the fireballs, sending her flying into the air. As Charlotte summons the government destructor and hits her multiple times in the head, she then uses blue magic to send her flying into the giant couch as explosions follow. Charlotte lands on the ground with a thud as Perry gets up and summons his giant paintbrush. Perry, yeah, all right, Charlie? Charlotte, better than ever. Narrator, Mecha Charlotte comes out flying comes flying out of the explosion and bombards Charlotte with a horde of fireballs. She quickly jumps out of the way of them as her and Mecha Charlotte clash, bl clash blades. They are able to match each other's speeds perfectly, but Perry decides to throw off the rhythm by throwing some black paint at Charlotte, which increases her power. He then uses the black paint to disarm Mecha Charlotte of her force field, which causes Mecha Charlotte, which causes Charlotte to land a perfect hit on the 
side of Mecha Charlotte's head, sending her flying into the air. She then re recuperates, realizing how much damage she she's received, and summons her Master Blasters. But then Charlotte summons her own Master Blasters, and the two lock beams, causing an explosion, sending all three of them flying backwards. Charlotte, don't you know that pain only makes me stronger? Mecha Charlotte, well, I guess that makes us the same. Ha 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 ha. Narrator, Mecha Charlotte summons a legion of buzzsaws and fire, fires 40 missiles out of her back. Charlotte sends them all flying back at her, and she dodges them seamlessly. Mecha Charlotte, did you really think you would be able to kill me with my own attack? Narrator, she is then cut off as she is hit with multiple red streaks of red paint, and then blue paint, which turns into water and causes her to glitch out. Charlotte takes this as her opportunity and hits Mecha Charlotte with the government destructor multiple times, with each hit being harder than the last. She then stops glitching out and hits Charlotte with her scythe, sending her backwards, causing her to slide in the dirt at high speeds. She then gets up as she summons a multitude of buzzsaws and fireballs. Mecha Charlotte counters this by putting her hands together and summoning a beam of pure concentrated ice, which blasts through all the buzzsaws and fireballs. Charlie summons a portal and then teleports behind Mecha Charlotte and summons a beam of pure concentrated fire. The ice beam locks with it and almost overpowered it if it weren't for Perry using his yellow paint to power up Charlotte's heat ray. Mecha Charlotte gets blasted in the air as Charlotte jumps up and slashes her multiple times. She then summons 50 Master Blasters around her as Charlotte lands safely on the ground and fires them, causing the Goofy Aw 2000 to explode behind Charlotte as she walks away with another star. Charlotte, next time, don't press my buttons unless you're ready to be rusty in peace. It's supposed to be funny because she just killed a robot, but the problem is that she's bad at humor. Narrator, Perry runs over and tends to Charlotte's wounds. Charlotte, thanks for the help, brother. That battle would have lasted so much longer without you. But don't worry, I still would have won. Perry, oh, trust me when I say I never doubted that. All rights reserved to Casino Co. Chapter 7. This Means War. Narrator, Isaac and Goldie walk into a battlefield of chaos. Jets are flying overhead, and countless of other plastic dinosaurs are getting shot at and disintegrated. Wave after wave of skeleton and human soldiers are being sent out to fight the plastic dinosaurs. But it seems as if the dinosaurs have allies, because tanks roll up with the name Mr. Jackfruit Embassies on the sides of them, and jets come that fight the other jets. Goldie, so what's the plan? Isaac. First, let's get your money back. Second, let's get that star. Goldie, I like how you think, buddy. Narrator, Isaac rides on Goldie's back into the battlefield. As they run by the war that is happening, they see the dinosaurs get shot down by jets and machine guns and magic being used. They see buildings being bombed as they run by. Goldie watches as they get killed one by one. Some of these people he knew, and some of the people out there he realized were not even from his universe, but from another. Obviously, the enemy was from another universe, but some of the people fighting with the dinosaurs were human too, and they were as heavily armed as jolly soldiers. Isaac was trying to help the best he could by throwing some bones out and puncturing a few of the soldiers on the enemy's team but he didn't want to be seen because if he was he would be instantly targeted due to his reputation across the multiverse isaac ah crap narrator isaac teleports him and goldie and everyone else that is nearby out of the way just before a rocket could hit them goldie and isaac are unfazed as they keep on running but the rest of the creatures that were teleported are confused they continue running forward just as goldie stops and looks up as his j jaw drops isaac what is it goldie look up Narrator, a giant missile comes flying down, one that could potentially end the whole war and kill everyone on the battlefield. Isaac, you have got to be kidding me. Narrator, he summons 100 raptor blasters and fires them into the air, causing the missile to disintegrate into nothingness. 
Now, all the enemy soldiers are aware of Isaac's ex existence, and they focus on him now to fear. Goldie and Isaac. Ah, crap. Narrator. But then a giant robot comes out of nowhere and blasts all the enemies that were charging at Isaac. Isaac. Okay, okay Goldie. You go. Goldie. Where? Narrator. Then the hood of the giant robot comes down, revealing Dr. Mustache inside. Dr. Mustache. Go disable the shields and the mighty cannon ship so that my jets can get to it. Goldie, narrator. Goldie looks into the distance and sees a giant wooden ship flying in the air with a force field surrounding it. Jets are getting shot down one by one by it. Goldie, yes sir, narrator. Goldie runs off as Isaac teleports off his back. Goldie, so you're helping these guys. Dr. Mustache, of course. I can't just let their land be decimated by that crooked jolly. Isaac. Well, how about we call it a truce between you and me? Dr. Mustache. No need, my friend. I already called it. Isaac. Thanks. Narrator. Isaac did not expect this response from him, saying that he just let out Mecha Charlotte the previous day. Isaac. So, do you have any tricks up your sleeve? Dr. Mustache. Well, I have the Tom Fleet and the Mega Tom coming. Isaac. That should do the trick. Narrator. Goldie runs as fast as he can. His goal is no longer to get his stacks back, but instead to help his fellow dinosaurs protect the homeland from an outer dimensional tyrant. 30 minutes later, narrator, Goldie now stands under the mighty cannon ship, with its intimidating shadow looming overhead him. Now there's just one problem. How does he get on? Then, from the corner of his eye, he sees an anchor beginning to raise. Goldie, perfect! Narrator, he runs past all the falling jets jet planes that fall and explode and he covers his face with his hook so no metal pieces fly in his eyes although this barely works he then jumps up with all his power and grabs onto the anchor as the mighty cannon ship begins to move and he enters the anchor storage room osphemorus is the anchor up stolutes yes sir osphemorus all right go let them know that we can start the pursuit stolutes Sir, yes, sir. Narrator. He exits the anchor facility. Osphemores. All right. Now what do I do now? Narrator. Goldie jumps on top of the skeleton, rips his skull off, and throws it off to the airship. Goldie. So where is the control room? Narrator. Inside the room he is in, there's a large anchor hooked up to the ceiling with a chain tied to it that seems to be connected to some type of mechanism. He goes to the door and opens it up to a well- Gaming lit hall that has a lot more light than the dark old soggy room he was in before. The walls are beautifully lit, light blue, and the floor a beautiful red carpet. He walks out not checking his surroundings before he does, just to be greeted by ten fully armed skeleton soldiers. Goldie, well shoot. Narrator, he jumps out of the way as they summon arrays of different bone patterns. A few of the bones clip into his plasticky hide. Goldie, alright, now you've done it. Narrator, he turns around and fires a rocket out of the end of the rocket launcher on his tail, blowing all of ten of them up. Nat Goldie, now I'm all out of rockets, thanks to you. Narrator, he switches back to the shotgun as he jumps over the newly made crater. He walks down the brightly lit hall as he passes many doors, but then he stops because he hears a sound that he can ne never forget. Goldie, Mario? Narrator, he continues walking forward as he sees a door being guarded by two skeleton soldiers. Goldie, alright, what would be a good disguise? He then remembers when he hid from the, those robots in the one night on the Jolly Rogers universe using the plant. Goldie, perfect! Narrator, he grabs one of the many vases with a plant inside of it and shoves it, his head in it. Plant. Plant. Hi, I'm a plant! Skeletons 2 and Skeleton 4, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, plant. See, I even have dirt! Narrator, he shakes his head back and forth as a few specks of dirt fall out. Skeleton soldier number 4. <sighs> I guess. Narrator, the two skeleton soldiers step aside as Goldie enters the jail. Meanwhile, narrator, Mario is in a tiny cage with a fan. He seems to be making funny noises with the fan. Mario, ooh, welcome to Mario's Tunnel of Doom. Goldie, hey, you big nerd, what are you doing in a hamster cage? Narrator, Mario looks behind his back and sees Goldie opening the gate to his tiny cage. 
Mario slowly crawls out with all his shirtless glory. Goldie. So, do you still have the star? Mario. Ooh, Mario's back is itchy. Ma narrator. Mario itches his back. Mario. Ooh, that hit the spot. Wait, what did you... Wait, uh, what did you say? Goldie. I'm guessing that's a no. Oh, whatever. Perry can deal with the star. Narrator. Goldie then goes and opens all the other cages as all the dinosaurs come running out. Skeleton Soldier 2. Man, why do I feel like a bunch of dinosaurs are about to come charging out of the door regarding Skeleton Soldier number 4? I don't know. Narrator. Then a swarm of dinosaurs comes charging out of the door, squishing the skeleton soldiers guarding it and shaking the airship as they do. Question mark, question mark, question mark. Hi, are you the one that broke us out? Narrator, the tip of Goldie's hook opens and almost fires at the soldier, but he hesitates for a reason. Wait, don't fire. I mean no harm. I know where the control room is in case you're wondering. Narrator, then the tip of Goldie's hook closes. Goldie, so who are you and why were you in jail? Mario, 21? George, I am George and I am a traitor to the kingdom for protecting a human named Scott a while back. Goldie, Oh, okay. So where is the set control room, you bag of bones? George. It's in the hallway, leading to Jolly's throne room. Also, there's another dinosaur in that room over there. Narrator. He points towards this large metal door. Goldie. How do we know we can? Narrator. Mario already punched open the door and went inside. Goldie. Really, Mario? Narrator. Goldie runs after him. George. So are you just going to leave me here? Goldie. Yeah, why? Narrator. Goldie runs in and sees Rexy, the T-Rex, attached to some machine. Goldie. Uh. Narrator. Mario jumps on the hooks, keeping her in place, causing them to break. Rexy falls to the ground, shaking the entire airship. Rexy. Ah, oh, jeez, where am I? Narrator, she barfs out a pair of shades that she puts on her face somehow. Rexy is a large T-Rex and is the last T-Rex. Her skin is a dark red and she has black spots throughout her body. She then stands up. She is 21 feet tall and a total of 50 feet in length. Rexy, gosh, where, gosh, where am I? Narrator, she barely manages to get herself off the floor. Goldie, better question, how are you going to get out of this room? Rexy, oh, the answer is simple. Narrator, she charges through the door and roars with all her glory. The ship shakes as she roars. Goldie, could you be any louder? Rexy, yes, actually, I could. Goldie, I'm pretty sure you alerted every guard in the building. Rexy, well, I mean, if you think about it, there shouldn't be that many guards in here because most of them are outside fighting. Mario, she does have a point. Goldie, oh, whatever, just try to be a little quieter. Narrator, they walk out of the room and walk into the jail. George, so are you guys taking me along? Narrator, he gets stepped on by Rexy. Jar George, my rib cage. Narrator, they then exit the jail back into the bright blue hallway. As they walk forward, Rexy's footsteps shake the ship. Goldie, could you walk a little softer? Rexy, oh, I'm sorry, didn't you forget that I am a T-Rex? Also, if there are any guards, I am a T-Rex, so I could probably take them. Goldie, last time I checked, they had missile launchers, machine guns, and magic. Rexy, eh, I could still take them. Goldie, <sighs> so do you know where Jolly's throne room is located? Rexy, no. Mario, I do. It's on the second floor of the airship. It should be pretty obvious because a big red rug leads to the thing. Goldie, oh, okay. Mario, be careful though because it's heavily guarded, but I think we can take them. Goldie, how do you know this? Mario, Jolly interrogated me for information. Goldie, and what did you tell her? Mario, I told her everything because I'm an idiot. Goldie, oh, you idiot. Narrator, the three encounter a fleet of stairs leading to the deck of the airship. Mario and Goldie walk up just fine, but Rexy's feet are too big. Rexy, I'll find another way. You two go to your destination. Goldie, you know what? No, you've saved my life one too many times. So Mario, you've chucked Bowser around before, right? 
21? Goldie, I'm just going to take that as a yes. Narrator, Mario goes down the fleet of stairs and grabs Rexy by the tail and yeets her up the stairs. Rexy, ouch, my back. Thank you, though. Mario, yahoo! Narrator, Mario jumps up the fleet of stairs with a simple jump. Goldie, all right, guys, let's go. Narrator, Goldie now sees the red rug that Mario was talking about, and the skeleton soldiers are lining it, at, and at the end of the rug is Carsreel guarding the door behind him. They all see Goldie, and the three, and they get in their battle stances. Goldie, wait! Narrator, Rexy and Mario look at Goldie, wondering what Goldie is doing. Goldie, Charlotte is coming. Narrator, all the guards' jaws drop. Carsreel, well... We will get out of here after we, we kick you off our airship. Goldie. Dang it, I thought that would work. Narrator. Rexy bites down on one of the soldiers and swallows him as all the other guards start firing bones at them. Goldie goes after Carsreel and Rexy and Mario fight off the other skeletons. Carsreel summons his two rainbow swords as Goldie blocks attacks with his hook and then kicks Carsreel in the head. Carsreel then summons a multitude of fireballs as Goldie jumps out of the way and turns around, firing multiple bullets at Carsreel. He manages to deflect them with his pristine accuracy using his swords. Goldie curls himself into a ball and throws himself at Carsreel. Carsreel grabs onto him, but his hands begin to bleed from Goldie's extreme speed, but he manages to gain enough strength to throw him off the side of the boat. Carsreel I hope you know. I hope you have some good insurance, because if you need some, you can always buy it for me. Narrator: Goldie is falling to his death, and he begins to remember all the good moments of his life: opening the casino, meeting Albertsons, getting his brother a job, and even his trip to Mexico. Goldie: No, I can't just give up now. Narrator: He spits out his emergency rocket and loads it in his tail, and then fires. The force of the rocket sends him flying back to the ship. He lunges at Carsreel and grabs onto him as he pins him to the floor. Goldie, now who's the one that's going to be flying off the side of the ship now, huh? Carsreel, <laughs> narrator. Goldie chucks Carsreel off the side of the ship. Carsreel, well, good thing I have this. Guys, jump off. Narrator, he pulls his portal clicker out of his pocket and summons a portal as all the skeletons follow behind. Rexy. All right, guys, good job. Narrator. Goldie can hear the sounds of gunfire, all different types of magic and jets flying, and in the distance, even Raptor Blaster is firing. He begins to wonder how Isaac is doing, but knowing him, he's probably just fine. Rexy smashes open the door as the three run to the long corridor leading to what they think is the throne room. On the side of the corridor is a room labeled Control Room. Goldie. All right. Here we are. Narrator, Goldie and the other two walk toward the entrance to the control room just as something crazy happens. Jolly Neo Point Two comes flying through the wall, gripping onto the giant robot that Dr. Mustache is in. The robot suit that Jolly is in is 25 feet tall and has a seventh star powering it. It is long and slender with a 50-foot wingspan, and John's robot suit is an egg-shaped robot with two hands and leg that are relatively the same size. His robot hands can both switch into plasma guns, just like Jolly's plasma launchers. She has Dr. Mustache pinned to the wall as she charges up her plasma launcher on her arm. Jolly Neo Point Two. Goodbye, old friend. Rexy, you go and disable the shields. I'm going to go help the doctor, and if I don't make it back alive, I just want you to know that the two most important things are honor and loyalty. Bye, friends. Narrator. Goldie and Mario reluctantly leave and run towards the control room. Rexy charges at Jolly Neo Point Two and bites the arm off that's about to fire the plasma at Dr. Mustache seamlessly. Jolly Neo Point Two. Wait, what? Narrator, Dr. Mustache punches her back as Rexy rams her into the corner. Jolly Neo point two. So this is how it's going to be, huh? Narrator, Rexy roars extremely loud, shaking the airship and making Dr. Mustache and Jolly Neo point two have to cover their ears. Jolly Neo point two summons 30 cards with legs and crowbars to deal with Rexy while she fights Dr. Mustache. 
The doctor summons multiple ice balls and sends them flying at her, but she counters them with fireballs. Then Jolly Neo Point Two jumps at Dr. Mustache and hits him across the robot's face. John counters this by grabbing her arm and attempts to punch the star out of the center of the robot suit, but she kicks Dr. Mustache back, causing him to lose grip of her arm. Jolly Neo Point Two, now you die. Narrator. Then Rexy spits a ball of paper and crowbars into the back of Jolly Neo Point Two. Jolly Neo Point Two. Oh, I forgot that you were here. Narrator. As she turns around, she sees the hole that her and John created when they flew in and sees Megatom crawling up the ship. Her jaw drops of horror as it disappears and she hears a loud thud on top of the airship. Dr. Mustache slash Jolly Neo Point Two slash Rexy. Ah, crap, narrator. A group of Tom units barge in and begin firing everywhere. Jolly Neo Point Two and Dr. Mustache fly to the airship as Rexy jumps onto Jolly Neo Point Two's back and bites out a chunk from the middle of the robot, taking off a piece of her actual leg from within the robot. And then she almost bites off her head, but be she fires... But before she could do that, Jolly Neo Point Two fired about 150 pounds of lead into the Red Rex's head, causing her to fall to her death. A creature that saved so many lives in her universe. A creature made of honor and loyalty. A creature that was there for Goldie and his father in their fight against Mother, the Indominus Rex, Scorpio, and Mr. Pork Grinder. She closes her eyes as she remembers all the great memories she had as she falls to the ground with a loud thud. The last T-Rex alive in the whole Goldie the Casino Raptor universe is now dead. Jolly Neo Point Two and Dr. Mustache land on the flaming floor of war. There is death all around them. Jolly Neo Point Two. Why are you helping these primitive creatures? Can't you see that I would just make their lives better? <laughs> Dr. Mustache. You call this making their lives better? Jolly Neo Point Two. Can't you see that? Narrator. She begins to puke out her own blood as she falls to her knees. Jolly Neo Point Two. That, that T-Rex took a big chunk out of me. Dr. Mustache. Why are you doing this? Jolly Neo Point Two. Can't you see that our choices don't matter in this multiverse, John. Can't you see that the Puppet Master is just pulling our strings to entertain those useless spectators? In fact, I bet there's someone watching us right now. Would I be correct, reader? Dr. Mustache. What are you saying? None of it makes sense. Jolly, back at home. Amber, I can't understand her, but she still believes in you. So please, let us help you. Narrator. John puts out his hand to help her up. Jolly. I would love that, but I'm afraid my story doesn't end that way. Narrator. She looks up as she tells everyone to retreat through her intercom. Jolly. Goodbye, John, and tell Amber I said hi. Now run while you still can. Narrator. John hears a blood-curdling laugh as he sees Charlotte come out of nowhere and beheads Jolly with the government destructor. One look at her glowing red eyes, and he crawls out of the robot suit and runs for his life. He looks back at Jolly one last time, the person he hated so much, and sees Charlotte rip her spine out as she licks the blood off of it like the psycho path that she is if there is one person john feared more than jolly it is charlotte john well i see mecha charlotte failed narrator he then looks forward with fear knowing that he is going to die charlotte tears the seventh star out of the robot suit and opens a portal in front of dr mustache and pins him to the ground while holding the government destructor john please don't kill me narrator she lifts the government destructor into the air John, please, I have a wife and children and people that count on me. Narrator. She then hesitates for some reason. Charlotte, why am I hesitating? I've heard this excuse millions of times before. How come I am hesitating? I am the angel of death and you are my prey. Narrator. She almost brings the axe down on his head, but then she stops. She drops the government destructor on the ground, and she falls to her knees. Charlotte, leave, before I change my mind. 
narrator. John runs for his life. Faster than ever, John. Thank you. Shara, I'm sorry I failed you, father. Narrator. Then she hears a voice from within her head. I am proud of you, Charlie. Narrator. She then hears someone talking to her as she looks up, startled. Isaac. Hey, Charlie! I see you got another kill! Narrator. Isaac sees the clean spine on her shoulder. Charlotte. No response. Isaac. Did he assassinate Dr. Mustache, too? Charlotte. Spared him. I Narrator. Isaac is in shock. Isaac, uh, I mean, I'm glad he did because he's shaping up to be a nice guy, but are you okay? Charlotte, I, I don't know. Narrator, he helps Charlotte up. Charlotte, this feeling, I've never felt it before. Narrator, Perry comes running over. The paint on his clothes drools down because of the rainstorm that just started. Perry, is everything all right? Isaac, Charlotte spared John. Narrator, Perry's jaw drops. Perry, I mean, I'm proud of you, sister, but after the whole Mecha Charlotte fiasco thing, I just, you know, what I'm, what, what, you know what, I'm glad you disobeyed father's orders. Narrator, Perry is questioning if his, this is his sister. He summons a portal. Perry, go home, Char Charlie. Charlotte, but I can still help. Perry, nope, go home. Narrator, Charlotte walks through the portal. Perry, I feel like something's up with her. So you go with her, Isaac. Isaac, but I don't want to. Perry, just do it. Isaac, fine, jeez. Narrator, Isaac walks through the portal. Perry, all right. Let's see if anyone needs help. All rights reserved to Casino Cove.